Chris Lee and Blaine Gilmer of Southeastern 14 here to continue our previews of SEC football teams for 2023. We're doing this mid-February, so a lot of stuff could change, probably will change between now and football season. We'll have plenty of updates on that, but uh, Blake, one thing won't change. Uh, Jimbo Fisher still the head coach through a tumultuous Man, what a, what a weird last 12 months for the Aggies. 13 months, 14, if you want to go back to signing day. The roller coaster of emotions, the 5-7 and seven season, the flashes of things at the end, getting a legit offensive coordinator a couple of months ago, more good recruiting, bringing some guys back. Um, boy, when the dust has settled, where are we on the Aggies? Yeah, I, I think that even despite – how rough it, it was and how drastically Texas A&M underperformed the expectations I think that its fan base had, that the people inside that building had to have going into that year, coming off the record recruiting class uh, that, they, that they had you know, prior to the season beginning that they wrapped up in the spring of 2022. And then, and then not having the, the year that they wanted going five and seven, I think there's got to be a lot of excitement. And I think that excitement has got to be because of, as you mentioned, a legitimate offensive coordinator. Bobby Petrino is one of the best offensive minds in football, bar none. Okay. He 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 really knows how to create space for playmakers. And that is one thing that when at least on the the top line, the the first string that Texas a and has uh, at the receiver position. You look at Moose Muhammad, who made some incredibly tough catches last year, contested grabs that, that you know, he, he just showed a lot of promise. Anaya Smith coming back is absolutely huge. Of course, Evan Stewart got kind of, kind of thrown into the fire as a freshman last year and had a lot of big plays. And then Raymond Cottrell is a guy they're bringing in the, in the recruiting class that's already being – you know, looked at as a guy who could produce early. He was originally committed to Georgia and flipped not long before signing day this past year. So Bobby Petrino has weapons for Connor Wegman to to attack and to to try to to try to target in this season. I think Connor Wegman, Chris, I was impressed with with him late in the year. I think he showed a lot of poise uh, and gave that Texas A&M team a, a spark that they desperately needed at the quarterback position. Yeah, and I'm going to be a little repetitive to some things you just hit on here, but when you got a quarterback coming back who's played before, I think his entire offensive lineman, a number of playmakers, you allegedly solved the issue of play calling and stuff with the, the hiring of Bobby Petrino, who's a great offensive mind. I mean, there is there's a ton of reason for optimism on that side of the ball. And we didn't even mention, I think, the best position group that they have on offense is their tight end position group. I really think at Max Wright, Donovan Green, and Jake Johnson, that trio may be potentially the second best tight end group in the SEC behind that of – of Georgia, definitely the one one with the most potential, uh, one of the ones with the most potential. Where they have the biggest questions at is running back, okay? Uh, Amari Daniels, Le'Veon Moss, Reuben Owens, all guys who highly recruited. None of them have a, a ton of experience coming in here. Um, you know, they've really had – basically one back carry the load uh, each of the last two years, um, so to speak. So now it's going to be, okay, who steps up? Is it going to be running back by committee? And how uh, how are they able to to run the ball? So Daniels, Moss, and Owens, the second, Reuben Owens, the second, a huge recruit that they kept in the state of Texas after he was committed to Louisville for a long time. Um, so that that's going to be their main question there. But get a lot of experience coming back up front, the quarterback's experience and targets at wide receiver and tight end. So a lot to be excited about, especially for Bobby Petrino. That's the main thing up front. They've got the the good first line, but with 22 players transferring out overall, Chris, offensive and defense, the depth could be an issue. So they, it's incumbent that, you know, Lady Luck's on their side and they, they stay stay healthy throughout the year. 
How are you feeling about them on defense? I mean, they get a lot of guys back. I, I know they lost some guys out of the vaunted recruiting class they had, but yeah, they got some athletes up front. They got some returning guys at corner. Um, you, you know, and Jimbo Fisher, for all the criticism they take, they're never bad on defense. So um, I, another side of the ball where I think they have to take a leap forward, right? Yeah, you get a lot of leadership coming back with Damani Richardson, a guy that that everybody thought for all the world would probably be gone um, after last year. So he's coming back for a fifth year. Very physical guy who can come up and kind of help set the tone in terms of uh, stopping things, you know, coming coming down into the box and, and playing things. Bobby Taylor is a guy who was part of that, that record class and really was a uh, – a vocal leader helped recruit other guys there. Um, you know, Bryce Anderson at the at the nickel position is someone that they got to be excited about. They get Tony Grimes in from North Carolina, a transfer corner that comes in that that ought to be a, a lockdown type guy right away. Uh, who who comes in and helps helps things out there? Shamar Turner, Walter Nolan on the on the inside are guys that were just massive recruits and and turner shamar turner i mean he's his third their year he was a third year there he was a five-star recruit um and then another shamar shamar stewart on the edge really started to make some plays uh as well and then they have experience on the edge and fidel fidel diggs who had a couple of uh you know strip sacks and things like that in the alabama game so the the talent is there uh they got a get some of that experience on the back end behind those guys to kind of fill depth wise. Like I said, the biggest question for Texas A&M, Chris, is not the front line, you know, talent in terms of first string on offense or defense. It's that depth. It's with, with so many players having gone away in the transfer portal, even if those guys didn't play, Chris, what people have to understand, they were there all last year. They were practicing with the team. They were learning the system. They were part of the, the, the strength and conditioning program. And then now they just leave and you got to start from scratch with either new guys that come in or, or, you know, true freshmen coming in. And that's not always the easiest. People also don't realize that affects your special teams too with with your coverage units and all that kind of stuff, guys in different roles. So that is my biggest question coming into this year for Texas A&M. It's not the frontline talent. It's the underlying depth on both sides of the ball. The schedule, let's go through this bit by bit. Um, open the season with New Mexico. That'll be one of the worst teams in the FBS probably, or at least it was a year ago. Week three, ULM, same thing. In between a game at Miami – Miami's one of those teams a year ago you saw, I think, in some preseason top 25s. This was a out-of-conference game that got circled by a lot of people. Miami woefully underachieved a year ago. I don't think made a bowl game, uh, finished 70s, 80s in the major computer rankings. I know Mario Cristobal, his thing is recruiting, and he'll do that. He's an alum, but I'm very interested to see that game and how all those teams match up. This will be the return trip, so Aggies will go into Florida for this one. It's the desperation bowl. It is. I mean, it's it's you know whoever whoever doesn't win that game is in some hot water. I mean, think about it. Week two of college football, Mario Cristobal. He he was not only not make a bowl, but he had a game where he just got absolutely embarrassed by Middle Tennessee State last year. Of course, Texas A&M had the same situation with App State, where they just couldn't you know pee a drop offensively and ended up uh, losing a low scoring game at home. So now you've got Bobby Petrino, you've got all this talent coming. Uh, uh, coming on the offensive side of the ball, you know, a lot of experience up front, quarterback returns. Now, can that translate on the road against a Miami program that's reeling as well? Chris, that's a huge game and a huge game. Not necessarily it's going to affect your conference play and all that kind of stuff, but just the mentality of your team. I would not want to to see what, for Texas A&M fans and program's sake, I wouldn't want to see what, it would be like to have to overcome that adversity if they go down to Coral Gables and lose week two. Then it gets interesting, too, because I, I like some of the ordering of this. Auburn, I, I say this all the time, I would rather catch Auburn early than late. Aggies mm -hmm. do that. They go to Arkansas. That's kind of a program that – Oh, you, you get the feeling listening to their fans is a little bit on the brink. 
Uh, so that could be interesting. And then, my goodness, Alabama, Tennessee. Two probably the uh, games to circle right there on that schedule for sure. Then there's a bye week, but that that little stretch right there against those four teams is the maybe the make or break portion of the season. Is there any team in America, maybe other than Auburn, that that's looking forward to the nine nine game SEC schedule more than Texas A and M? You would think because man, that is brutal. I mean, that is a brutal four game stretch because even with Auburn and and Arkansas being more middling type SEC teams. Man, they they fight you every second of the game, and they and they they have talent in their own right. And then there's a lot of excitement with Hugh Freeze over there, so that is an interesting one. At least they get them early on at Kyle Field, like you mentioned. I think that's a that's a positive thing for you. But you you mentioned it, Alabama and Tennessee. Not only do we as people who are going to be watching these games have that one circled. You can guarantee that even though Alabama won that game last year, Nick Saban's going to basically treat it like they lost that game last year and try to try to motivate his guys when like, hey, you should have lost this game. You haven't proven anything. You know, you, you haven't been to the playoff in two years, X, Y, Z, and they got to go on the road uh, to Kyle Field over there. So that'll be interesting. And then they, then Tennessee at in Knoxville is never easy. Yeah, in, in case you've forgotten, and if you're watching our channel, you probably haven't. Um, A&M was in a miserable spot a year ago. Alabama had it rolling and went down to the last play of the game. Okay, bye week. South Carolina, that'll be interesting. That'll be at Kyle Field. At Ole Miss, an, another program that I think is getting to a little bit of a crossroads after the Lane Kiffin shenanigans a year ago. Mississippi State, Zach Cornette, we don't know how that's going to go. Then Abilene Christian, then boy, at LSU, the, the game that nobody wants to play next year. And, and that will be in Baton Rouge. Yeah. I mean, you know, when it comes down to that, that's the one where Texas AM stood up last year and and you know, really virtually didn't have anything to really play for. And man, they 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 really hurt LSU in terms of impacting going into that SEC championship. LSU was had a had thoughts of, hey, if we, if we go into this SEC championship and we beat a Georgia team, we could possibly make the playoff. But Texas a and ended that a week or week or two early by uh, coming out and playing inspired and, and winning that that ball game. So um, there's been flashes, there's been moments, Chris. But this schedule, I don't care if Abilene Christian's on it or whoever's on it. I mean, it's just you know, in terms of the non-conference, even with New Mexico and Abilene Christian uh, on this schedule. It is remarked, remarkably tough. I mean, just absolutely, you know, with, with South Carolina and Tennessee being the East teams you play, and then, of course, everybody knows the West. Um, it's just a tough It's just a tough slate, and, you know, it's why the expectations are what they are is because everybody knows, hey, that this is what it is year in and year out, and it's time for um, Jimbo Fisher now with the, the help of Bobby Petrino to see if they can – really turn things around um if, if i'm going to ask a question to you chris what would you think would be the the standard i mean obviously you know that you want to win every game but what do you think would be the definition of success for fisher and petrino uh after a five and seven season I'm thinking maybe eight and four, and I don't know that it's unrealistic because again, continuity is one thing that I really like of them on offense. Plus, you know, you get a whiz bang offensive coordinator like they've got that changes a lot of stuff. Um, you, you would you would think that he had weeded out some of the problems and the and the bad culture issues from a year ago. Um, I mean, I'm seeing a And M in some early top twenty fives, albeit. At the at the very very bottom of those, to to me eight and four is kind of. I don't know if you set the the over under at it, seven and a half eight, but I I think. I mean you you can't make it ten or eleven based on recent history, but I think based on the talent and all those other things, to me that's right where it falls. Is that where your head is too? Hey, you know a lot of people say uh, August fourth is a and M day because they go eight and four so often, you know, but uh. We'll we'll see if they are able to shake that. I think Texas A and M fans would rather punch themselves in the face than go eight and four just for that principle alone. Uh, so I think that um, I think you got to 
listen, this is going to be the most experienced team in terms of offensive line, in terms of the defensive uh, front, you know, bringing back Richardson in the, in the backfield that I, that, that um, Jimbo has had since that 2020 year where they won uh, double digit games and won the, won the uh, orange bowl, I believe it was. I think 10 wins is, is what you got to try to, to shoot for this year with all the pressure on you, because I know that buyout is huge and things like that, but eventually the A&M faithful will lose, lose patience. So 10 wins are bust is what I'm saying that they got to try to try to go for this year in terms of, what would success look like for a and If we have not previewed your favorite SEC team, hold on because that's coming. We've either done that. I think this is actually 13 or 14. So we're getting close to the end. So if you can't find your team, you might want to scroll back a couple weeks on our feed and you will. In any case, we'll have all kinds of updates on the Aggies and, and all the other teams between now and and kickoff of next football season. Best way to get all that, hit that subscribe button and hit the like button. Both those things help us. He's Blaine Gilmer. I'm Chris Lee. We're Southeastern 14, and we will see you again soon.